Hello everybody and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd, we're excited for another chance to hear from you and answer all those gardening questions. You can submit your questions to our volunteer phone panel. You dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 1-800-676-5446. Picture questions and those emails go to byf at unl.edu. If you send us those emails, please tell us as much information as you can, including where in the state you live. During the week, be sure to check out our social media options that include Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. Jonathan, it's a teensy weensy little insect. Yep, just a wee little bug this week. <laughs> wee little bug. Uh, these were brought into my office earlier this week by some clients, and they were complaining that they had fed on their roses, and they had moved on to some saplings that they have growing, some maple saplings, mm -hmm. and they are causing some chewing damage on them. When I took a look at them, it turned out they were a weevil, and they are part of a small group of weevils that are, uh, they have a different sort of nose than most weevils. We usually think of a weevil as having that long nose that's kind of classic for them. And they're all kind of collecting down at the bottom here with their poop. Uh, <laughs> they are part of a smaller group of weevils that have a broad nose though. And they're called the imported longhorn weevil. Kind of gray in color, have long black antenna that are elbowed in the middle. They feed as a larva on the roots of grass plants and alfalfa and clover. And then as adults, they feed on lots of different vegetables and perennials. They even attack soybeans. They're a big soybean pest sometimes. For my clients, I would recommend seven on a plant to try and protect those leaves. And if you're seeing them on your own plants, that would be a possible insecticide for you to use. They also get inside. Just vacuum them up when they come inside, though. All right, so seven as long as the great pollinators are not flying. Right, right? just on the leaves. Don't get it on the, the flowering portion of the plant. All right, thank you, Jonathan. We're a little disappointed, Matt. You're not spraying yeah, anything not or sprinkling shoot anything. Any chemicals on Jonathan no. or anything like that. <laughs> uh, like today, someone. yeah. Uh, today, I just I have a weed, uh, one of the most common weeds, uh, the one that's probably most targeted in any lawn, uh, large crabgrass. Uh, if you see, we have a little one here and a bigger one. Um, now is the time. If you do see this in your lawn, you'd probably see like yellow leaves popping through the canopy, and if you're mowing it really low you're gonna see those sooner. This was actually out of our research plots that were mown at about an inch and a half, so they're coming very, very quickly. If you have a thick lawn, you're probably not gonna see them as readily for another couple weeks or even a month yet, or maybe never. Um, but when you have thin areas in the lawn, uh, they can really flourish. So uh, if you are seeing them pop up now, uh, it's, it's probably uh, your last chance to try and control them. Uh, as they get bigger, they're gonna be harder and harder to control. Uh, so looking at some of the herbicides that work well, uh, once they're up, uh, one of the pre-emergent herbicides, uh, Dimension, which is Detiopir, that one actually works well up to three to five tillers. And the bigger one that I was holding here is about two to three tillers. Uh, so you get much past that and it's tough to control with some of those uh, easier herbicides to use. And with Dimension, you're gonna get residual throughout the rest of the season. Uh, some other products that work well would be uh, Quinclorac, that one works well on young crabgrass like this, up to that three to five tiller stage, or even past, but as it gets bigger, sometimes it's gonna take two applications. Um, tenacity is also another one that works well when it's young, um, and also a newer one, Pilex, which is Topramazone. That one works pretty well. And then the last one would be Acclaim, and that one works only on grasses, not broadleaves. So if you have other weeds in the lawn, uh, pick the right one. If you have multiple, multiple species, uh, some of those herbicides work better than others. So now, now's your last chance. Get at it and get rid of them if you need to. All right, thank you, Matt. Okay, Kyle, one of our favorite plants doing Indeed. a bad thing. Well, I get so jealous sitting next to the plant of the week all the time with these fancy <laughs> vases, so I have to set my game up. And so yeah, I actually uh, brought a Husker Red Penstem in today. And this one is just starting to uh, develop some leaf spots. Uh, most likely rust, and you can tell that if you flip to the underside of the leaf, you'll see some of these, uh, the acial spores, they're just almost forming these uh, little gelatinous tubes that are for coming out, out of the bottom of that lesion. But on the top, um, we just see the, that nice kind of pink lesion, um, a bit of chlorosis or yellowing around the outside with the darkened center. That center can fall out as infection increases. As far as control for this, 
really don't recommend doing a whole lot. Um, Sanitation is going to be your best friend with a lot of your ornamental leaf spots. So as soon as you start to see them, just go and uh, pluck some of those infected leaves out. Try to decrease the infection, infected, infection um, potential. Or, or you can also just wait for the temperature to change. About a week ago, I thought that these penstemon would be completely loaded, and then it cooled down, and now we don't have near the leaf, leaf spots on it. So. All right, and we do have that in, on dark towers in our backyard farmer garden. Yep, I've seen it on quite a few yeah. penstemons this year already. Yep. Thank you, Kyle. All right, Dennis, no live snakes tonight. No, we have some <laughs> stuffed food of said snakes. Um, <laughs> People are confused. They call both these animals a gophers, but actually only one is the true gopher, and that's the plains pocket gopher. And it stays underground, and this is the plains pocket gopher. He doesn't come above ground, and he's a herbivore, so he eats roots. He doesn't eat the roots of grasses. He likes tubers better, so if he's after the bulbs. And this is the real gopher, and he leaves big mounds. This is a 13-line ground squirrel that comes out during the day and eats seeds. And he lives a hole about the size of a golf ball. Perfect size, and there's no dirt around that. And he likes short grass. Um, and so this is not a gopher, it's a 13-line ground squirrel, and this is a gopher. Some people mistakenly call this a chipmunk, but we don't really have chipmunks in Nebraska. They barely get into the state within a couple miles of the Missouri River. And chipmunks are a wooden creature, and we're a plains state. So again, and the reason why you need to know what is a gopher and what is a ground squirrel, because if you go to our, our guides for control, gopher, ground squirrel. Okay? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Dennis. All right, you get a whole lot of pictures that yeah. are insects that are what isn't what a to do about crew. a motley crew. <laughs> So your first one, actually, Jonathan, is a couple miles west of Kearney, worms on wild plum, uh -huh. uh, wonders good, bad, or whatever. So I looked around on this one, and I'm pretty sure that this is a web-spinning sawfly larva. It's part of a group called Hymenoptera, the wasps and bees and sawflies. So this turns into sort of a wasp-like creature when it grows up, even though it looks like a caterpillar right now. They have a more prominent head than caterpillars, and more pro legs in the back. They have six or more pro legs, six or more pairs of pro legs in the back to control it, blow it out with water, or you could spray by fenthrin or neem if you wanted an organic option. Okay, so then we have a south of Blair variegated elderberry <laughs> with <laughs> little worms. Yeah. Uh, this is a caterpillar, some sort of moth or butterfly. I think it's a Quaker moth caterpillar based on the green color and the stripes and this nestling behavior that they're portraying here. If I could see the rest of the tree, I would like to because I'm wondering if there are other tent-making caterpillars possibly in the tree, if it's causing a lot of damage. BT would be an option for any pest caterpillar, though. All right, and number three is Alma, Nebraska, and this one's on hostas and coral bells. All right, we'll bring it home with some coleopterans here. This is a beetle larva in this particular <laughs> image. I talked to Jim Kalish about this one, and we agree that it is probably an elm leaf beetle larva. <laughs> they used to be a big pest on elms, so I'm guessing that this isn't associated with the hostas. It's more associated with a tree nearby. The larva does wander off of the tree to find a place to pupate. That might, might explain why it's on that hose there. If you do have elm leaf beetle and a systemic imidacloprid applied to the tree, we'll take care of that pest for you. Awesome, nice job. Thanks. Matt, you also have two so. pictures. <laughs> one, is, one is what would work and the other is what wouldn't. So this is actually uh, Hornick, Iowa, Les Hills. She wonders what these are. She says they're not phased by tenacity. Um, so A, what are they, and B, how do you control them, and then we'll follow that with another one. All right, I think uh, the left one, um, it's kind of shriveled up, but yellow sweet clover mm -hmm. is my, I'm pretty positive that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And then on the right is foxtail barley, and that one you see all over roadsides. And mm -hmm. uh, for the left one, or for the, the yellow sweet clover, uh, any of the combination products, uh, broadleaf control, um, some with 240 e dicamba, that mix in there. Uh, those do work, but when they're big like that, they can be tough to kill. You might uh, kill the leaves and knock them down, but they'll probably grow back out of it. It's gonna be more of a fall out. And then the foxtail barley, there really isn't any good control, especially in a lawn um, for that one. It'd be a select or non-selective herbicide such as Roundup to get rid of them. All right, and then you actually had a Sydney viewer who said thanks for telling us to use Tenacity because 
he sent us a picture saying he followed awesome. instructions and it worked. Yes, and I think on this one he was saying it was that colonial bent, which was kind of hard mm -hmm. to pick out. And just to be uh, safe on that one, you might get the bleaching right away, but I wouldn't. Uh, I would recommend still applying a second time or maybe even a third time because creeping bent can be a really tough tough one to kill with just one app of that product. All right. It usually takes multiple. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Okay, so this is really odd, Kyle, this year, but we have about four people asking us about what is going on with purple foliaged barberry, including rose glow. And that's what your pictures are, and it's okay. like dead stems in the barberry. And, I, you know, honestly, I didn't know anything could kill barberry. <laughs> yeah, I thought barberry was one of those that we had to go and destroy to, uh, to take care of wheat stem rust. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it kind of looks like these, uh, this barberry just needs some rejuvenation. So it does look like um, we have some live, some living um, stems that are coming out on, on kind of on the edge there, but the middle looks pretty dead. So I would recommend just going and uh, pruning out some of those dead branches. If you want to do a complete rejuvenation, that might not be a bad idea. Rules for that would be prune out one third of the, uh, one -third of the stems this year and then continue that for the next three years. With any luck, then it'll come back looking as good as ever. All right, so we don't think it's a disease. Probably not. Yeah. There could be something going on with the root system, but I'd recommend just cutting some of those uh, branches and see if it comes back first. All right, thank you, Kyle. So unfortunately, our picture is not great, but our question is on this okay. one. <laughs> this is actually a viewer in Exarban, and she says she has a family of raccoons using their 40-year-old linden tree as a hideout. Uh, come out of the sewer, scramble up the tree. This is actually mama and three babies. She doesn't think it's harming the tree, but she wants to have them removed or relocated. And she's thinking they're better off in a state park. Okay. <laughs> that's, uh, for one, that's illegal. And they would probably die if you translocate them more than 100 yards. Everything around them will probably beat them up and kill them. Um, you can't, there is an option if you don't want them live trapped and then properly disposed of. There's Nebraska Wildlife Rehab, and these are people who have a special permit that allows them to, so to speak, translocate in certain locations. You cannot, you cannot translocate and move raccoons yourself. That is illegal in this state, okay? You're giving the problem to somebody else and they'll probably die fairly quickly if you don't know how to do it because um, they're very territorial. All the other raccoons in that area will just tear them apart. They won't make it. Um, so definitely you can, you know, if you want to do it yourself, you can cage trap or call Nebraska Wildlife Rehab, Inc. Awesome. Thank you, Dennis. Well, on that note, if you have any junipers, arborvita, or cedars around your home, chances are you already know what bagworms are and what they can do. Left alone, bagworms can really severely damage the foliage, even kill plants. So let's take a few minutes to hear from Jonathan and Jody about what you can do to keep those bagworms from taking over. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, Jody. I see you found the bagworm. <laughs> yeah, bagworms. so you see the ever brown instead of the evergreen. <laughs> yeah. And if you look a little closer, you can see some of the brown pods that are the bagworm. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a little about those? Bagworms are caterpillar pests that feed in many of our different trees and shrubs, and they construct a silk bag out of the materials on hand. They use whatever they can find, so needles, leaves, berries. They glue it together with their silk, makes them masters of camouflage so they can blend in with the plant that they live in. They hatch out in May or June here in Nebraska, and they feed voraciously up until about August or September when they become mature caterpillars in the bag and then pupate. And then they have a very interesting life cycle as adults, right, Jody? Yeah, they do. It's always very interesting to me. So the male bagworms, they pupate in the fall and emerges as a moth with wings, small, furry, has feathery antennae. And the female, unfortunately, never gets wings. She actually pupates into something that looks like a caterpillar, but doesn't ever leave the bag. The male bagworm finds her as a moth through pheromones and mates with her while she's still in the bag. And then he dies. 
the female then can lay 100 to 300 eggs inside that bag, which overwinter and emerge in the, the late spring the following year, which completes the cycle. But besides from being so interesting, why should Nebraskans care about this crafty caterpillar? Well, they do feed on a lot of the trees and bushes that we grow in our landscapes for ornamental reasons, as well as for windbreaks. They love junipers, they love arborvitae, they love spruce, they love pines, all these different things they can damage. Deciduous trees they'll even feed on. They like locust trees, I've seen them in oaks. And the feeding that they cause can cause this bronzing that we looked at before. It can be very unsightly, but over a successive generations, they can cause enough damage that it could kill the plant. So you do wanna nip them in the bud when you can. And there are lots of different ways to do that, right, Jody? Chemical control for bagworms is early to mid-June, while the bags are still small, so about half, less than half an inch long. The best thing to use right now is Bacillus thuringiensis, which is BT, very effective on caterpillars. And if you miss this window in the June month, then you can probably use carbaryl or a pyrethroid such as bifenthrin. You want to make sure that the plant is completely covered so the bagworms that are feeding can acquire a lethal dose. And you want to make sure, because this is an insecticide and risks are always involved, to read and follow the label. If they don't want to use chemicals, Jonathan, what's the best option? Well, so BT is an organic option, but if they didn't want to use any insecticides whatsoever, there are things that you can do where you go out and just to cut the bags that you can see out of the tree. Use a pair of scissors or shears or a good sharp pocket knife to cut them out. The top of the bag can be quite tough. And then once you get them out of the tree, throw them into a garbage bag and put them in the dumpster or throw them in a bucket of soapy water. Just be sure to destroy them somehow. Don't just throw them on the ground. They could hatch out from there and crawl up into the tree and then infest it that way. So always get out there and take those bags out. That'll stop reinfestation. But you do need to keep an eye out because they can balloon in from surrounding areas. So always keep your eyes open on your tree the next spring. Even if you do cut them out, you wanna make sure that you monitor that new bagworms aren't popping up in your tree. So whatever you do, don't let your evergreens get half in the bag. <laughs> Always monitor your trees. So if you do see a few on those trees and shrubs, picking them off is a sensible way of controlling them. If you let them take over, as Jonathan and Jody said, you're going to have to resort to a chemical or move. Yeah. <laughs> Always move. Always move. <laughs> All right, so Jonathan, you have a couple from two different viewers. Okay. and. And uh, one of them is Mondamon, Iowa. <clears throat> says, found gooey stuff on the dogwood. Mm -hmm. What can they do about it? Okay. The other one actually found gooey stuff on brome stems. Okay, so the gooey stuff here is not a loogie that somebody left behind on your plant. It is the foam that a spittle bug produces. Spittle bugs are really neat. I feel like I say this every time I'm on here. It's one of my favorite insects. <laughs> uh, I really like seeing them out there because they create this foam with moisture in their body that they expel out with oxygen. The inside of there is a little lime green nymph of a frog hopper. And inside there, they are protected from moisture fluctuations. They stay nice and damp. If you were to kind of play around in there, you could find it and you could look at it and be amazed by how cool it looks. <laughs> As an adult, they can jump really far. They have really big legs that help them to do that. And they don't usually become a pest. They are sometimes a problem in strawberries and other ag situations. So we don't normally recommend control, but if you do have a lot of them and want to get rid of them, blasting that off there with a hose will destroy the foam, and then they're exposed to the elements and they quickly shrivel up and die. Cool, excellent. But don't, just let them be, they're cool. Just let them be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Matt, this is actually a control of weeds in a wildflower planting. This is a Cass County viewer on an acreage. Makes it tough. Yeah, I know, about 1,200 square feet. She, she did say she'll be patient with yeah. whatever we tell yep. her, but what are we gonna recommend for this kind of thin first year's yeah. worth? I mean, that, that first year, especially when you have new establishment and there's nothing to shade out the weeds, uh, you're going to have all that flush of weed growth. Um, for when you're doing wildflowers, you can't really use any broadleaf herbicides. There's a couple herbicides you can see in here. There's a bunch of crabgrass, uh, such as like uh, Grass Be Gone or Fusillade, which only control grass and they won't harm the, the broadleaf weeds. So if, if grass is the bigger issue, I would definitely try one of those products. Um, and then if there are big broad leaves in there, you'd be probably better off pulling them out. I think it was a smaller area, mm -hmm. thousand square feet. So yeah. um, you, you'd be better off using your time just pulling some of those broad leaves out. Exactly, all right, thanks, Matt. Okay, Kyle, we have a couple of pear questions. Uh, and the first of these is some leaves turning yellow and browning on about a fifth of the tree, but it is setting fruit. He's saying it was sprayed, but didn't say with what? So that's kind of the first one, which is almost 
fire blighty? Yeah, it easily could be. Um, yeah, anytime we see on anything in the, any of those uh, trees in the rosaceae family, so apples, um, cotone asters, pears, fire blight is a bacteria um, pathogen that we do need to be careful of. Typically, of the fire blight, though, you'll tend to see a little bit of a shepherd's crook um, mm -hmm. appearing at the end of the branch. The bacteria infects uh, actively growing tissue. And so often, just right at the last couple inches of that branch, there's going to be just kind of jet black to brown and then kind of crooked over. And I don't necessarily mm -hmm. see a lot of that on here. Mm -hmm. So maybe a little closer so, up picture on Yeah, this one. closer up picture I think would be beneficial for this one. Okay, and the second one is Bennington, uh, the bright orange spots on the pear. Bright orange spots. Um, <laughs> that looks like rust um, mm -hmm. to me. And so one of the things... Um, Unfortunately, if you start, once you start seeing rust pustules show up on, on your pear or your apples, it's kind of too late to do a whole lot about it. So this year, I would just really focus on um, sanitation. So remove any of those uh, diseased leaves that have fallen um, and make sure to destroy them as best you can. Uh, don't compost them. Uh, burning works the best. And then next year, if this is a if, if this is a pear tree that you're um, you're worried about, maybe uh, think about some sort of early spring fungicide application. Right as those uh, right as those blooms are starting to open, that's going to be the time to hit it with a fungicide. All right, thank you, Kyle. Okay, Dennis. So um, this is this is kind of a fun one too. This is mounds in the soil. Okay. Large mounds of soil um, appeared in the backyard kicked one over and then they've reappeared in the lawn. It wasn't full of insects or termites, wonders what yep. we these think. Are moles, these are moles, eastern moles. Okay. Um, and these are the mounds that you can tell it's chunky, it's less than two foot in diameter, less than a foot high, and it's conical, and so it's definitely moles. Moles push up at their head, and there's a mole that got a uh, mound that got hit with a lot of rain. Uh, definitely not pocket gophers. Pocket gophers would be much bigger and fan-shaped and finer dirt because they push it with their uh, paws instead of their head. Um, so it's definitely eastern mole. And you, I, you can go with either with some of the mole traps. There's a four or five on the market, uh, harpoons traps or others. If you didn't want to go the trapping method that's lethal, you can go with uh, some of the products for mole control. Go not with a poison peanut or anything because all they eat is earthworms. Go with the uh, gummy worms, the earthworms. Uh, there's several brands out there for the public um, and you can use those as directed, exactly as directed. Do not cut the worms. Um, the poison's only in one spot. So you have to put the whole worm in the tunnel by using a latex glove or nitrile glove. So if you use those worms exactly as directed on the label, they usually work. All right, thank you, Dennis. Well, we've had a number of storms roll through the state this week. Thank heavens for rain on the, in Lincoln. But it's also been pretty hot for a while. It does seem like our garden is loving this weather, so let's take a minute to see what's happening out in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, we're enjoying a little bit of rain. For the past few weeks, all those storms that a lot of people across the state of Nebraska have been getting have been missing Lincoln. So we've been putting our ir new irrigation system to use and we've been tr testing it out and making sure we are getting enough water on our gardens. As you can see, we actually have these little tuna cans sitting out and amongst all of our garden. We have those down, we're keeping them in place and that is what we're using to actually figure out how much precipitation is going down on our garden. So we have our tuna cans down, we're measuring how much it is, we're seeing that about a third of an inch and we are running our system four times a week. So we're getting about an inch, just a hair over each week. We may have to adjust a little bit as our plants get bigger, but this is a way you can also track water and precipitation in your garden. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden this week and check out how we're measuring the precipitation in our garden. Thanks, Terry. And once again, we always love to have people stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden anytime you're in Lincoln. 365, we're open. Okay, so questions just for questions. This is near Morse Bluff. Noticed 
what we think is soldier beetles hanging okay. out on the raspberry plants. Are yep. they doing any harm? Are they good guys or bad guys? Soldier beetles, no, they're out and about a lot this year. They're not pests. They come out in droves, though. It looks like something that might be a pest just because there's so many of them. But they're pollinators. They feed on nectar and pollen. They get their name from their bright colors and the fact they look like old military uniforms. They're kind of related to lightning bugs. That's why they have that soft, leathery top wing. But no, they're not causing any damage. No need for control with those. Perfect. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, so on the June 14th show, Matt, uh, Jeff recommended sedge hammer or dismiss until today. Yeah. <laughs> but didn't say why till today and not later. Well, I think the, the reason, I mean, there's been a lot of research done on it over the many, many years. Uh, the reason that is the longest day of the year is when they're saying that at that point uh, you want to get it before that uh, because the tubers are already forming underground. So you're basically killing the plants that are there but you're not affecting those tubers that are forming in the yellow nuts edge. So uh, we, what we've seen is the sooner the better. As soon as you can see it, or if you know you have problem areas, try and make sure to hit those areas um, as soon as possible with either those two products. Uh, if you wait till after, you're still gonna control them, but you're not gonna have as good a control and they're still gonna come up next year from the, the tubers that they form underground. All right, thank you, Matt. Okay, Kyle, I think we've maybe talked about this a little bit before, but we, we continue to have people asking us about diseases in cedar trees that would cause big wads of dead branches. Any ideas? Well, if it's a whole branch that's, that's, uh, that's being affected, most likely you're dealing with some sort of canker issue. Um, and so I would just follow that dead branch back, and you'll probably see some sort of localized lesion. Maybe the, uh, maybe the bark is sloughing off. And then just prune that out um, was really the best thing that you can do for that. All right. Thank you, Kyle. This is all the way from Kimball, Dennis. Okay. How do you keep prairie dogs off your property? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Good one to go to break um, with pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. There there's several products that can be used. Most of them are restricted use. Um, shooting does not really, it stop, shooting stops the movement. The thing is, what are they getting into? If they come into things like corn or soybean, they'll turn around and go back. Um, if it's a native prairie or a short grass prairie, then that's something where they can have food. And then the other reason is, what's the problem? Because our new research is showing that cattle get a gain in some cases when they're on prairie dogs. So um, every situation is different, but there is uh, chemical controls out there available for prairie dogs. Uh, for people to use, uh, the ones that work well cost you about fifteen to thirty dollars an acre, um, and they give you ninety-seven percent control. Um, but to stop movement, sometimes because it is legal to shoot them on your property, not on your neighbors. Um, if they're getting out to your property, you can use a firearm. Dennis, yes. starting with you. We actually had a viewer ask us after you showed your eight foot bull snake where she can buy or get one. You cannot. <laughs> uh, you can entice them to your yard. The regulations in Nebraska, you cannot translocate any reptile or amphibian. I'm not sure it will help write that law. But anyway, um, so you have to bring them into your yard. You can't find them in one location and bring them to your yard. And it's illegal to exploit, which means bar, sell, trade any reptile in the state of Nebraska. All right, do foxes return to the same place to create their dens every year? Yes, close by. All right, so if people have turtles that have baby turtles, where do they take the baby turtles so the birds don't peck them to death? Well, hopefully if it's out in nature, just leave them be. Um, but if, it's, if they're born in captivity, then it may not be a native, so don't. Okay, so holes in the stream banks along some of our uh, reservoir lakes about two inches in diameter what would that two be? inches diameter right along the lake mm -hmm. muskrats muskrats okay voles apparently whoops we'll ask that one later okay okay so you forgot that first question was lightning didn't yeah, you yeah i did <laughs> <laughs> okay kyle are you, you guys this, is a good answer. <laughs> this time you get to win Hard. ever again <laughs> yeah over. thanks dennis i need that okay all right kyle are you ready so we had a viewer send us a picture of his Swiss chard in a container and there were shrooms coming up in it. Okay. Wants to know, can he still eat the Swiss chard? Uh, yeah, avoid the mushrooms though. 
Okay. Are there cultivar differences in diseases or herbicide resistance in tomatoes that you've seen? Yes. Um, the heirloom varieties, we tend to see a lot more damage. Um, they're more susceptible to diseases as well. All right. We have a Bellevue viewer who says the leaves of their spaghetti squash are going off color, kind of a silvery, leathery color. Silvery leather. Um, could be if it's kind of fuzzy, you might be looking at um, powdery mildew, something like that would be my guess. Okay. We have a viewer who said shrooms keep coming up constantly in their yard for two years or more. Mm -hmm. What can they do to completely get rid of them? Uh, wait a couple more years until those mushrooms decompose all the wood underneath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, there are also a couple of uh, fungicides that can be applied. All right. So powdery mildew seems to continue to reappear on things like choke cherries. Is that going to permanently damage the plants? Uh, yeah, it's probably going to be there continuously. Just uh, do, do some strategic pruning to increase airflow through the foliage, and that should decrease the powdery mildew. All right. Thank you, Kyle. You ready, Matt? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Enthusiasm. <laughs> no. So we actually have viewers saying, is it time to fertilize again? Uh, if your lawn is looking a little yellow, it is probably time to fertilize if you haven't put too much on in the spring. All right. And what is the temperature at which one does not fertilize? Uh, you probably don't want to do it when we're having 100 degree weather like we did last week, but when you have a rain event coming up, when you know it's going to get watered in, go ahead. All right. Uh, this is a Norfolk viewer who wonders whether Plateau or Ornamec will work on mare's tail in wildflowers. No, I don't think it will. Plateau might, but it might also kill some of the wildflowers, that would be my guess. All right. Will mulching grass clippings, which we often recommend, spread Creeping Charlie all through the yard? Mm, it could, but I'd say keep mulching, but you need to control those later in the fall. That way you're getting rid of them so they're not going to produce seed every year. All right. When should newly seeded turf be mown for the first time? As soon as you can get on there and it's, you're going to be taking some clippings off. All right. Uh, we have a Henderson viewer who wants to know how to control clover. Clover? Mm -hmm. uh, Quinclorac works really good this time of year. 2,4-D will just kind of set it back, but it'll come back. Quinclorac is the one. All right. Excellent. Nice job. You ready, Jonathan? I'm going to get try, seven try to keep that. the pattern going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a viewer who asked us whether colony collapse is still going on in this part of the state. Uh, colony collapse has tapered down a little bit in the last few years for honeybees. It is specific to them, but it could still be happening here in Nebraska, yes. All right. Uh, tick an eighth of an inch large attached to a human being. What kind would it have been, maybe? Our most common ticks here are American Dog and Lone Star ticks. It would probably be one of those two. All right, and then we have somebody who said they have lots of ticks in their yard. What is the way to control them? By Finthrin in the area where you're seeing them the most. Okay, we have a viewer who had a black insect with white spots on it in their asparagus. Asparagus beetle. And? Uh, seven would work on that one. Okay, uh, is it time for grub control? It's almost out of time for grub control. Do it before July 4th. Okay. Uh, are there specific plants you can plant to encourage lightning bugs? Yeah, ground cover, euonymus, or just let your grass grow a little taller. That will help them with habitat. Okay. How do you prevent twig girdlers in oaks? Uh, you clean up and do sanitation in the fall and get rid of where their eggs have been laid and those limbs that have fallen to the ground. You're supposed to say pass. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Where's my trophy? Where's your trophy? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Is that it? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> the victory gopher. <laughs> All right. Well, that was good, guys. So I get the pleasure of the plant of the week this week, although we were going to threaten to have Dennis do it and see if he knows anything about plants other than what eats them. Uh, we have, these are all from our backyard farmer garden. Let's start with the cone flowers. And I picked just a handful. The top one here is actually our native pale cone flower with those long rays. You might see this blooming all over roadside ditches. Uh, it's used a lot and, and spreads beautifully and does not revert. This is what it looks like. And then the ones that are these wild colors uh, are the ones called Cheyenne Spirit which actually are seed produced. They bloom the first year from seed. You never know what color you're going to get, but it's usually a pretty mix. And they're on shorter stems, so they're a little hard to cut. And then we have one on the back side here that is one called hot papaya. And that one has kind of this great big head in the center of it. 
uh, kind of a fluffy looking thing. We've had that one up there perennially for about, um, I don't know, three or four years. And then this fine flowered little yellow thing is actually called bush honeysuckle or dyer villa. This is a cultivar called copper. It's a shrub about three by three. And the copper cultivar gets its name because the new foliage has a beautiful kind of a copper color to it. It's very tough. It does send out uh, stolons or a little bit of, does a little bit of running about. But so this is just a handful of the cool stuff in the backyard farmer garden. Yet one more reason to visit. Absolutely. And yes, I did have to brush some bumblies off I, those cone flowers. They're very popular with They're very popular yeah. with insects. All right, so speaking of insects, our third uh, picture is for you. And this, this one, he sent it in early, Jonathan. Okay. It's on a hawthorn. It's an oh. older hawthorn. And a uh, great big rounded looking sort of, exactly. Yeah, I brought <laughs> those one things. with me. <laughs> those <laughs> things. Uh, he says he thinks it's spreading rapidly. Yeah. What is it and what, it, what, what can be done? This is the hawthorn mealybug. It's a type of mealybug that lives in hawthorn trees, as the name might imply. Mm -hmm. These are the mature females that we see at the tips of these twigs here. Okay. Uh, they get that white fuzz on them as they get older. And if you kind of poke them, some red stuff will come out from underneath that looks almost like human blood. It kind of frightens people. <laughs> they overwinter as immatures in the bark of the tree, like nestled between the bark cracks. So in the winter, you could do a dormant oil spray and it would destroy those immatures. Or this fall, you could try and do an imidacloprid systemic treatment from the root zone up into the rest of the tree and it will control them next year. The tree should survive this year. You can do that control in the fall or in the winter though. Awesome, excellent. They looked a little scale-like, yeah. so I'm glad you made that correction. I thought maybe Dennis would taste them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tempt him. <laughs> okay, Matt, you have a couple of pictures, uh, and this first one is a, a, a turf, he thinks, yeah. that is lighter green than the other turf and grows about twice as fast, hasn't spread much, but he, he doesn't, he's yeah. thinking, does this need a non-selective or what? It's, yeah, it's, it's a grass, but it's not the grass you want. It's orchard grass. Oh. Uh, it's kind of got a flat leaf to it or kind of a folded venation. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look down at the base, it's flat. And that one does grow a lot faster, and that's the telltale sign. It probably grows two to three inches before the bluegrass does, or uh, it's kind of what it looks like it's in. And there really isn't anything selective to take it out. So one of the best options is if there is only one, just go and pull it. Otherwise, the only other option would be a Roundup, and you're going to kill that spot, and then you're going to have to wait for the bluegrass to fill in. If you pull it, it's going to go a lot faster. Um, and it is a perennial, so every year it's going to grow a little bit bigger and bigger. And if you let it seed out, it's just going to spread to the rest of the lawn. So keep mowing it and try and pull it out if you can. All right, and then your second is actually somebody who said, how do you get rid of yellow nut sedge? Because it kind of looks a little like orchard grass. Yes, and that one, the same uh, methods can apply at this time of year. If you do want to pull it out and get it out, it's not going to kill it for next year. Uh, getting on it early is the best thing, and sedge hammer actually works, and it's pretty safe on a lot of the ornamentals. Uh, you're not going to spray it on the ornamentals, so if you could spot spray, uh, that would be best. Or even Roundup in that case, you're going to use a non-selective in that area and kill them too. All right. Thank you, Matt. Okay, Kyle, you have beans, beans, one, two, three here. <laughs> and it's actually three viewers. The first one simply sent us this picture. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that could be a few things. I'd be really curious to see what the entire bean mm -hmm. patch looks like. Um, if you're seeing seeing that pretty widespread, um, it could be just some sort of, um, right, just, uh, if you're watering overhead, maybe the water was um, sitting on the leaves, causing some of that deformity. The other thing is there are some ring spot viruses that beans can get. Um, and so if you are starting to see that fairly common, you may want to, uh, to go ahead and start um, removing those plants, especially if you're seeing it on the new growth. On the new growth. All right, and our second one is yellow spots on pole beans. Um, and yeah, that again could be um, a few things. Uh, I would guess maybe one of our mildews. Uh, they, the, the lesions do look a little bit angular and kind of yellow. And again, best control for that's going to be um, anything you can do to improve, um, improve air circulation through there. So if you do have some plants that are just looking really poor, rogue those out, try to um, increase airflow through that foliage. Okay, and this third one is actually, it's appeared next to a soybean field and it's on all the cu 
cucurbits, and this is in Burke County. Is this herbicide splash? And I think if I'm remembering correctly, it was not only on the cucurbits, but on pretty much every other plant mm -hmm. in their yard as well. Mm -hmm. And typically, if you're seeing these uniforms, uh, uniform spots on a whole bunch of different plant species that are occurring right at the same time, probably you're looking at some sort of herbicide injury. If you are right next to a soybean field or some, or some sort of ag field, chances are even more likely that a little bit of drift hit them. All right, thank you, Kyle. Okay, Dennis, this is Farnham, Nebraska, so Dawson County. Okay. Uh, Buckeye, three years old, recovered from bad hail, but woke up to saw this shredding going on. They have mm -hmm. cats and puppies, but they've never shredded trees before. And he sent us, I think, some, yeah, some. Yeah, it's been cut at the bottom and stripped up, which, not a bobcat, not a porcupine. It's not when deer would never go to the bottom and run up like that. I see no claw marks, no teeth marks. Uh, I'm thinking almost mechanical. Maybe some kids in a go-kart ran through the yard at night one time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it doesn't look like wildlife. Um, I can't see any signs that point to wildlife. Uh, it's hard to say what it could possibly be, but all the typical wildlife that would strip in that area, whether, you know, bobcat, deer, porcupine, nothing like their damage. All so right. it's, it's still a bit of a mystery. I would, you know, try to do some more investigation because it looks like it was cut or hit the bottom and stripped up, which is the opposite of what animals do. All right, trail cam. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, you know, we featured a few community gardens here on Backyard Farmer over the years. One new project we visited recently is in South Sioux City and it's an example of how some communities can use empty spaces to grow healthy and nutritious food for those who need it. Um, it was started um, about five years ago with Voices for Food grant project. And we did planning and this was a, there was an old house here and there were trees here that we had to tear down. And we started this garden. We started by planting perennials, um, raspberries, asparagus. Um, I had a couple of current bushes so that they, they take time to start producing. And so then that way, now we're harvesting without having to plant. <laughs> well, I kind of have a passion for fruits I'm kind of a nut about that. So the strawberry patch got out of control. It's going to have to get rained in this summer. But we've got uh, raspberries, red and black, on opposite ends. Um, we've got asparagus that we've harvested um, lovely early this spring. Um, and we, I guess that's one of the fun things about gardening. Plant something that you haven't planted before. So we've got three kinds of peas. We've got shelling peas that we just finished. We pulled those all out and we planted purple, purple um, bush beans in there. We've got, we're harvesting today on snap peas and snow peas. Well, we have a great crew of people that come and help. Anybody that's interested in gardening, some years we've had uh, church groups come for uh, a day or a half a day. Sometimes we have other gardening neighbors that just like to come. The way we operate this is we call it a cooperative learning garden. So if you work in the garden, you get some of the produce and then we take um, others to share with people at the pantry. Um, I usually help with the weeds, picking stuff and all that. Once the currants grow, I'll, I'll probably Pick. My grandma will probably pick that and then bring it to inside and we'll make like current jam, current juice, and that. Well, I usually help plant seeds and water the plants that we already planted. And like if that already have the dirt around them, but you actually just plant them, that um, I usually water those after we plant them too. Well, um, there's quite a lot of people in our community, uh, surprisingly, you might not realize it, but that are not knowing for sure what they're gonna eat at the next meal, or maybe not knowing about trying a new, a new food, trying a new vegetable. Um, and that's the best place to try a new vegetable, it's fresh from the garden. 
Uh, it's at its very tastiest and most nutritious right there. Um, and it's interesting, if a kid's worked in the garden, they're much more apt to try something and like it than, than not, whether it's beets or peas or whatever. It's really heartwarming to see how these gardens can spring up across the state in all sorts of communities. They bring people together for a good cause. We had a great time in South Sioux City and we're going to see more of a different effort in the orchard on, a, on another show. So lots of, lots of good stuff Tune going on. That. Tune in, tune in. There you go, Jonathan, there's the push. <laughs> okay, you have uh, two pretty unrelated, but they're insect pictures. Good bugs, okay. Yeah, yeah they're buggy. Uh, one is in Homer in, Deco in Dakota County, okay. holes in the radishes and the lettuce. Okay. She did get a picture of the insect yeah. before he roared away. <laughs> this is a flea beetle. That damage is pretty descriptive of them. They create mm -hmm. shot hole type damage where it looks like somebody shot your plant with a BB gun or with bird mm -hmm. shot. They get their name because they're quite small, eighth of an inch, sixteenth of an inch, and they have very large Schwarzenegger-like back legs <laughs> that help them to jump and flee from predators. So that's how they get their name. Uh, in terms of control, you could do several different things. Just try and blow them off with water when you see them, or you could coat the leaves with something like seven or spinosad if you were into a more organic option. All right, excellent, and watch that uh, date to harvest, right? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, all right, your second one is, is or was, was <laughs> a rose. <laughs> this is a rose, a rose slug sawfly problem here where they have mm -hmm. window paned all those leaves. Uh, what would be your your prognosis for this plant, Kim. Let's go by a rose. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, usually they're not quite that thick and that bad, but they do create that window painting as they feed. It's a type of sawfly as well. BT won't work on them despite the fact that they look like a caterpillar. Blowing them off with water, again, is gonna be a really effective strategy, or you could try spinosad for them. All right, excellent, thank you, Jonathan. This is from Seward County, Matt. A uh, client brought in this weed, taking over the lawn, smothering the turf. Oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had this one before. Yes, and yeah. this one is getting big, yeah. big especially this time of year. Uh, prostrate knotweed. Mm -hmm. And that one uh, comes up really early. It's a summer annual, really early in the year, sometimes in February, March. Uh, so getting it when it's young, it's still probably young enough to be able to get good control on with some of the uh, broadleaf herbicides. Uh, 2,4-D alone usually doesn't work very good. It'll knock it back. Uh, like I always say, it's better to have uh, multiple products in the ammo or in the in the in the what do you say the, the pocketbook the there <laughs> the chamber in the chamber. Uh, so uh, going with a combo of let's say 2,4-D, dicamba, triclopyr, those um, a lot of them have those products in them. So. All Hit right. them now, and if you wait longer, they're gonna be a little bit tougher to kill. All right, thank you, Matt. Okay, so this is a Firth viewer, Kyle, who is having issues with their zucchini, which is just fine with me, because I don't like it, but. <laughs> Fried zucchini is delicious, though. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, I don't think those will taste too good. <laughs> um, that's, so yeah, it kind of looks like uh, we're starting to see some blossom end rot mm -hmm. appearing. Uh, it's very comp can appear on really most of our garden vegetables, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, you name it. Uh, typically, blossom end rot is caused by a lot of uh, some few different environmental factors, and so one can be a calcium deficiency as those fruit as that fruit is forming. The other thing is inconsistent watering. Mm -hmm. So the best that I would recommend is just try to uh, have some sort of watering schedule for those 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 plants and just stick with it throughout the season should be your best bet and hopefully the rest of your uh, zucchini will come out looking just fine and you can fry them up and it'll be delicious. Or bake them into bread. Or you can bake it into bread as well. <laughs> All right. Okay, this is a carny viewer, okay. Dennis. Um, he noticed what he's calling a ridge of poo under the eaves of his house. Okay. And there's a shingle that appears to be lifted. He's wondering if a bat lifted it and tunneled and could the bat chew through plywood so there's the, the ridge, and then okay. he's also got a second handful of, of what we think for sure is back okay. guano. This does not look like, that's back guano, that mm -hmm. picture. Uh, the first one, that light-colored frass, does not look like bat work, and bats can't chew for, through about anything. Their teeth are too fragile. Uh, when they've bit me, their tiny teeth break off in my skin. Um, <laughs> so I think that would be more could be bird or something else lifted that because bats could not lift that shingle 
uh, but some birds may be able to lift a shingle, or a squirrel, if that's wood chips, I couldn't, mm. I can't tell whether that's wood chips or, you know, frass or something like along those lines. So, but that I would say is more birds or possible squirrel because it looks kind of round, maybe more bird. But the other picture is definitely um, bat droppings. All right. So I would think those two are in different areas. Yeah, that's definitely bat droppings. Okay, thank you, Dennis. All right, so just regular old questions. Jonathan, uh, at the break, we had a picture of a beautiful moth yeah. with kind of an eye spot sort of thing going on. What was that? That was a Cecropia moth, my absolute favorite insect. I accidentally raised one when I was about 14 years old, and that was when I decided to become an entomologist. I was like, this is really neat. I think this is what I'll do for a living. Uh, it's just a really beautiful moth. Largest moth in North America, beautiful coloration, big eye spots on the back, very fuzzy. The males have large feathery antenna that they use to find the female, and this one here is a female. You can see she's laying her eggs mm -hmm. on this post that we see here, and mm -hmm. out of that will come some really large caterpillars with red and yellow knobs all over them. Mm -hmm. So there you go, beautiful, and thanks to that viewer for yep, sending that. That's awesome, that. great, yep. great picture. Okay, uh, Matt, this is an Oakdale viewer, has foxtail all over their yard and wonders is there a selective control for foxtail? Uh, there is some selective control for foxtail, but once it gets big it is pretty difficult to control if it's already heading out uh, now it might not be heading out so uh, Quinn Clorac is one of them or Claim which is Phenoxyprop uh, those two would be the ones that I would go after uh, Tenacity also does work but it sometimes when that uh, foxtail gets pretty big or it starts heading out it doesn't control it completely so those would be the three options and good luck because foxtail can be a pain in the butt <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you Matt Okay, so you brought in Penstemon with a leaf spot, mm -hmm. and we had a viewer who is south of Lincoln, southwest. She's saying that she has Penstemon that have this distorted, sort of curled, wrinkly crown in that sort of rosette of foliage, and I think you said you've had the same Yeah, thing. she may have been in my backyard right next to the uh, Penstemon <laughs> with the rust. <laughs> I'm actually seeing the same thing show up in my yard, and I have no idea what it is. Um, could be some sort of, could be a pathogen, maybe a virus or a phytoplasma, something like that that can cause some of those just larger growth deformities. It's not herbicide injury. Um, I don't think, it, I can't really pinpoint anything environmental. It might just be a unique penstemon that we're growing now. <laughs> or not. I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Wish I had a better answer. All right, thank you, Kyle. Okay, Dennis, so uh, we have an interesting question about the disappearing onions. Okay. And this is somebody who says they're going down the row, live in a remote area of the sand hills. Something is going down the row, pulling the onions, leaving no signs except a hole where the plant was. Nothing is left but the onion, no prints in the soil. The onions are pulled but not dug. Okay. <laughs> remote area of the sand hills. Yeah, I was just there. Um. <laughs> I say bird, avian, because uh, they would, they're too light to leave a print. Um, crows, um, and there's either other grackles and other birds that would love onions. And so uh, I would say it's avian, so it's some kind of bird creature doing that. Because any other creature, you know, mammalian type creature, would probably dig them up and leave the tops and just take the tuber. But a uh, bird would take the whole thing. All right, thank you, Dennis. Just a little bit of time, Jonathan, okay. for you. Right. So we have people who have been sending in pictures of zinnias in particular that have little tiny holes, and you've got about 20 seconds. Okay. Probably a flea beetle, just like we talked about before. That shot hole type damage is very indicative of them. And there, like I said before, seven or spinosad, things like that would also work on them. Okay, so will those flea beetles get the flowers too, or are they just going to attack the foliage? Usually foliage. focus on the foliage. All right, yeah. so if they don't mind bad leaves, they can have good flowers. There you go. That's the way to look at it.